By the way, what tonight is not, it's not too much in depth about all the particulars. Okay, your four years of English, your three years of math, you know, I can get into like what happened to your freshman year, and I know that there's a lot of knowledge out there. You can find that, and if you don't find it, I'll give that to you. What, what you don't get is you don't, don't get this imagery. The stuff that I presented first is what your hook is. That's your sale. You gotta have that product, all right? Everybody works from the wrong end of it, and then what happens is the kid get on the field, and she has to hit a home run or a double to, to really create the attraction, all right? So we're working from that other direction, that we want to create product first, and then we take care of the particulars. So when you're taking care of your recruiting business and you're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, all right, the 98th percentile, okay, 98 percent of people in softball will be doing these things, and you need to be able to do them. So the 98 percent of people out there, well, you got to complete your academic requirements, right? So you got to do well in school, and you got to know your requirements. You got to you got to meet your 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 needs, your classes. Um, so quickly stating about that, that's what, that's what the clearinghouse is for. Okay, so the NCAA clearinghouse is something that you would start that process usually about your junior year, and you do that through your high school counselors. And basically the NCAA clearinghouse is, it's, it's a check, check and balances of your classes. It's so that colleges know that you've taken the classes that need to be taken so that you are ready for college. All right, so that your, your classes transfer. Okay, so your, your clearinghouse and being able to be academic, academically ready is all part of this process from your freshman year all the way through, all right? So your academic requirements, you gotta do that. Minimum GPA, you know, you wanna, you wanna keep it at least 3.0, and I know that most people are very ambitious and they're, they're, they're making GPA is higher than that, but I wanna give you the parameters, okay? So bottom line is, if you're a 2.8 kid and you're doing as best as you can, you'll be all right, you just have to study. You have to study, you need outside work. So 2.8 is about the low mark for me. Anything lower than that, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, sometimes kids go home and they don't have a lot of help at home and they're raising their brothers and sisters and there's different things going on, but anything lower than a 2.8 gets a little harder for me to put any credibility out there because there's usually something that's keeping that Get from kids in above, a little above that water, above that point, and they tend to just have trouble with that general curriculum. So 2.8 is not what's really what you want to hear. You want to hire than that, but don't panic if you're 2.9, 2.95, you're not a failure. Everybody's throwing their, their success out there and their achievements, but use 2.8 as a benchmark, okay? If you're not a basket case around there, you're just at that low end. Anything below that, you need help. Okay, you need to get yourself help. And if for some reason you're not academically ready by your freshman year in college, that's what the junior college system is for. That's where I spent my first two years in, in, in college. It was a JC program. And then baseball, it's, a, it's, a little, it's perceived a little bit differently than, than softball. But if you want to play softball after high school, you're going to. I haven't had one single girl not play in 20 years after high school. And I understand you're worried when you're not being recruited. Okay, you don't have to be that. Okay, the other thing you're going to be doing is you're going to get yourself out there with your email, your profile, your phone calls. you got to get yourself out there, all right? And yes, you're going to have parents that want to do it for you because they're experienced in the business world, but you need to get experienced players. Players, you need to get experienced. You need to be making those, writing those emails, and then have somebody check it out. You need to be making sure that you understand the content of your profile. You need to start making phone calls at the right time and get used to that because you're not going to want to do it. It's not going to be a comfortable situation for you. But um, you need that experience because with that experience, you gain more confidence. With that confidence, you fine tune your presentation. With that presentation, you steal more deal. All right. So uh, think of like the uh, maybe the real estate business. I don't know. I'm not, not real estate agent. But you, I know you got to knock on doors, right? And you got to knock on doors. And I don't. I would imagine the first few doors you knock on people. Are, yeah, sure. I'll stay here. Also. Door gets slammed in your face, leave me alone, no solicit. You gotta knock on the door, you gotta go out there, you gotta get experience and own your skills and, and, and try to create some type of successful procedure there. So get yourself out there, you do that with your emails, your profiles, your phone calls. We could do a whole seminar on all those procedures. It's out there. It's out there. Uh, Kathy Arati's got a book out there. There's, there's, there's a lot of uh, resources out there for just general stuff. Okay, the 98 percentile also then start to do this. Okay, so here's why now I caution you. When you catch yourself doing this, Beware, all right? The 98th percentile start to worry about playing time and coaching decisions a lot more than they worry about the things that they can control, OK? 
Okay? Control it. You know, we start to get into the John Wooden stuff or the, the mental side of playing the game, you know, so you start hearing control the controllables, right? And then the first thing we do when things aren't going well for that kid that is our center of our lives is we start to get angry. We start to get protective. And we start to get resentful. And then we don't pay attention to what we're saying. And we just keep going down that road. And then we stand next to another dad whose daughter's not playing or not in the top of the lineup. Or maybe she's not pitching anymore either. Maybe my daughter's not pitching anymore and your daughter's not playing shortstop anymore. And then we start talking about the concerns of the team and what's not being right. Just when you catch yourself doing this because this is a disease that can be cured, then you just have to make a choice not to do it. But it's a disease and it's poison because it's the opposite of everything that I talked about so far. And it's what you hear just about in every field. If you try to find a field at the recruiting age where you don't hear some group of parents concerned about the operations of the team. Now, I'm not telling you that there aren't concerns and you shouldn't be concerned about things, but be careful of the traditional conversation and that you're doing things just because somebody else is doing it. Pay attention to the happiest people out there. Try to find them first. And see what their point of view is. See how they view their daughter as the daughter is performing well or not performing well. There's a different disposition. And we use a, um, a baseball player's set of parents as an example. He just broke his ankle, so I know he's done. But Derek Jeter's parents. Every time and any time you've ever seen a, a, a camera shot to Derek Jeter's parents in the, in the stands, what do you see? What, what do you know about them? They're a mixed couple, okay? So I know that that's the first thing that's noticeable, okay? His dad colored, his mom not. And the second thing is that they've shown his parents 25 to 50 times. I think this is what I've seen every single time. So, if that's not your nature, become that. Find something you can attach to and become that. So I talk for a living. When I'm on TV and I've got these TV games, you don't hear Tony Rico and you don't see my mouth open. That's not my nature. So I picture, for me, I picture two coaches. Joe Torre. But Joe Torre, when he, when he was coaching with the Yankees, because it was a little bit harder to watch him with the Dodgers, and that Dodgers on my team. But, you know, when Joe Torre would coach with the Yankees, and the Yankees are out there and they of the Yankees and he's in the dugout and he's got his toothpick in his mouth and Jeter's throwing the ball away and they've lost nine games out of ten and the fans are cussing him out and they just threw another ball away and you know for whatever reason now because I'm a coach and I notice these things but after an error after a bad play the camera goes to the players and the camera goes to the head coach right and Joe Torre would just do this maybe shift his eyes to the left he was assistant coach but that would be it and the other one was Phil Jackson when he was coaching the Lakers you know, Lakers in October and November, and they're just, they're making a mess of things, and he would just sit there with his leg across, and people would be screaming, call a time out, stop the bleeding, and he would just sit there. So I picture myself as those guys, not being my nature, but in every TV game, there's, there's a gather around myself, because it's not about me, it's not what I'm teaching, it's not about practice, it's not about skills, it's about the chance for the girls to be out there on the field. So. I fell into traditional traps when I started coaching, traditional analysis. When I started with the batting lessons, I was breaking everything down and giving videotapes and impressing everybody with everything we knew, which is what most of you want in your batting lessons. That was 20 years ago for me. I'm way over that. I'm way over that. A lot of you are just you're starting to go off of that buffet up. Okay, I'm done with that stuff. I understand that. So traditional things, I fell trapped to it. I've had my own development, try to get that balance for myself, but be careful of that. And when I say focus very little on the show, well, the show is everything that we spent our time talking about so far. Show is the girls. The show are, are the dancers, the actors out on stage. What are they doing out there? That's important. Very few people focus on the show and just support that beauty and that expression. So the 98th percentile, you pretty much will hear the same conversation over and over and over. And you have parents of players that are obviously doing well. And things are kind of falling in place, and they're going to have the stress of having to decide which school they're, they're going to like and where they're going to go. So it's, it's, it's a good situation to be in, but it's still very stressful. And then we go to the two percentile. All right, so if we're doing everything that everybody needs to do, and we're in that 98 percentile, here's the secret of the firecracker recruiting. All right, because you have to be academically ready. You have to get your emails and everything out. But how do we become the two percentile that get past the 98 percentile? All right, so hopefully you're with me on that. Because that's when I think about our success, that's what we've done. 
So the first thing we do is we create a powerful image. Even our 1,200 kids in there, are you guys aware of how you look? Did you, those of you that were here last week, did anybody go and look at themselves in the mirror with their back? Not how you dress for school, because when you guys dress for school, you're very comfortable in the mirror. I'm telling you, watch the girls the first time they pick up the bat from the mirror, they go like this. But think about that. Think about most of what those girls have heard. Okay, they did a great job after they hit the ball well, but anybody that's played this game, how often are you hitting the ball hard enough and as often as you like it, right? So what happens is the feedback is you're, you're pulling off the ball, you're flying over Shoulder. You're rolling over, like, don't dip, don't drop, you're overstriding, you're dropping your hands, why are you dropping your hands, what were you thinking today? So you get this, and you get this bombardment of the things that are important to the guy, which we spent time talking about that last week, the Mars and Venus factor, right? So we're obsessing over the fact that things didn't go our way, and she just is having that image just torn down. Or not being built up, and not being built up. So you have this apprehension, you have this anxiety, the shoulders get tight, the motions are all fast, she's anxious. No, forget that. The way that we do this is we create our image. So now let's go to another profession. Let's go into the police academy. Let's go back into the military academy. Let's go into the firefighting academy. Let's go into what's called command presence, right? So are they, I don't know, police officers, it's the first thing to do is put a gun in your hand. First day in boot camp, the first day is put a, a, a rifle in your hand. Or is it command presence? It's how do you walk? How do you talk? Right? How do you sit at the table? How do you button your shirt? How do you make your bed? How do you, how do you look? How do you represent with honor? And then yes, there's target practice at the shooting range, which is your batting cage. Then there's simulated stress, right? So the pop-up targets and people yelling at you, oh, 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 oh shot ran off, all right, okay, no, but that's your practice range. So, that's, so you go into those simulations. We don't really have that in softball. You're stress training on your games. We don't have situations where they're, you're putting stress on you, but it's development to say, hey, you know, we're going to stop this right now because you just threw the last four pitches in the dirt. What's going through your mind right now? Uh, um, uh, this hole's bothering me. I saw that like at our combine a couple weeks ago. Four pitches went in the dirt. I walked out there and I worked with this kid. And I said, what do I train you to do? She kept looking at the hole. Make adjustments. If one ball goes down low, where's the next ball go? High. If one misses inside, where's the next one miss outside? If one misses outside, where's the next one go? Inside. Are you ready to make your adjustments and stop looking at the hole? Because now I came out here, there's not even a hole. It's not even a legitimate hole. You're, you're born into the making the excuses. Stop it. Throw the ball higher. Can you do that? Yes. But wait, I have to ask her. What are you going to do? Throw the ball higher. Great. Now I can walk away because if I say that to her, Dad, and she goes like this, she didn't picture throw the ball higher. She's like going, okay. And then the next ball goes in the dirt. So the pitcher goes back and goes to the next five pitches over the strike zone. She threw the next five pitches for strikes. A couple of them got hit. But man, what a difference now she presented herself. All right? So create your powerful image. Create that command presence. My favorite picture I try to tell every kid that comes in here is that female soldier over there. She gave up her beauty queen crown to be a, she's a European soldier. She's got the beret on her. She's got the, the rifle in her, in her hand. I'd like to know that if she needs to, she could put that bullet right between my eyes, just like the mother lying over there. She needed to hunt for her kid. She could do that. So you've got to be capable. So player, create your powerful image. How you walk, how you talk, everything that we talked about at the beginning of the seminar. Build strong personal relationships. All right? So build them. So if you start doing what the 98 percentile do and you send your profile, your profile is going to sound like this, okay? Um, I was in... Florida last summer with the Junior World USA team. And Mike White from Oregon and Mike Larrabee from Arkansas were my roommates. And they said, Tony, you guys want to see, you want to see something? So they put their iPads out on the table and they said, listen to this. They turned the volume up and it was going bling, 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 bling. And it was emails coming in from recruits. I said, how many do you guys get in a week? Well, I've answered most of them. I'm down to 270 now. It is not uncommon for them to get 1,700 emails. So everybody's doing it at the 98%, right? And you know what your emails sound like? My name is I'm 2,000. My great point average is I'm I'm So imagine if we're, we're, we're music producers, right? And everyone's trying to get their music to us. And anybody in the music industry knows it's a brutal business. How fast are these CDs getting put in and thrown out? Thrown in, thrown out. It's like two seconds. So if you don't cook right away, 
it's gone. Do not, rule number one of your, you're trying to get in the music world, don't put your best song second and don't put the best part of your best song uh, two minutes into the song. Because unless you have a contact, you'll never get that far because it's like a commercial. How long are commercials? 30 seconds. And if we don't like them, we turn before the 30 seconds. So you have to find a way to hook. So build a strong personal relationship. But what does that mean? What does that mean? What can you do? When you guys start making phone calls, but before that, do your homework on these college coaches. Do your homework. Know that that college coach is still at that college that you're writing, because that's one of the mistakes players make all the time. They give their information, and then they write to a coach, and then the coach tells me, hey, how nice, this is the email written to the coach that was here three years ago. So you'll find your list, but make sure your lists are updated. Do your homework on your coaches, because when you personalize something to those coaches, do your homework. Where do they play ball? Where are they from? Every coach has a profile on their website. And then when you make that phone call, or you write that email, Hey coach, I just saw that you grew up in North Carolina and that's where my grandparents live. And I hope that someday we can just talk about just what that was like because I visited there a few times. Uh, hey coach, I noticed that you played ball at Las Vegas and uh, that you're coaching there now. And it's just kind of wondering, hopefully we can talk about it. I just really want to know what it was like as a player. Now for every coach in here that gets asked a question like, how come I'm not playing third? Mm -hmm. Coach, can I talk to you? Um, how come I'm not that anymore? Okay, reasonable question. You have to understand what that does to the coach's mind. And then the coach looks at your name on the line of the board, and the first thing they think of is, oh gosh, is she waiting for me again? Oh, there she is. But what if that coach looks at your name, and that first thing was, remember that you want to, hey, coach, um, listen, I don't want to come off the wrong way, and I, I understand like it's a really hard job, so I don't want you to take this the wrong way, and. I just, if there's any chance, if there's something I need to do more of, if we can work together, if there's any way that you know, the situation is right, I can just get a couple more of that mask, but I know your job is hard. So the attempt to be gracious right there is going to stick. The verbatim words aren't, but the attempt to be gracious is going to help. Um, walking up and just sticking around and helping pick up practice, do things. You're the player that's not playing, Mackenzie. You're not on the field, you know, but you're not giving me stink eye. Your parents aren't sitting farther and farther down the line because now they're not talking. So, and then here I am, and I'm one of those coaches that don't make the team that do anything. So I'm picking up balls, and then here you are. You're just picking up balls. Part of the term, you're not kissing butt, okay? We're not, we're not kissing up authority. What we're doing is we're personalizing. And all of a sudden, if I look at your name, and my first impression is like, she stayed after the party pick up balls. I'll tell you what, the girls that, that the girls that don't pick up balls in these cages will probably remember it more than the girls that pick up cages because most of the girls pick up balls in the cages here. Even if they're coming in and they're sitting down and they see the balls in the cage and the one hitter just hit the hit balls and she's up there picking up the balls, you appreciate when somebody helps you pick up the ball. These are just little examples of how to personalize. That college coach sees your name on the email, the Texas firecracker coming in, so, oh, okay, the Texas team. Oh, hey, so it's, it's McKinsey. Well, wait a minute. Last time she wrote, she knew that I played ball at North Carolina. And so there's an attachment there. You're now in the two percentile. I know this because I sit with these coaches. I'm, I, I have better personal relationships and friendships with these college coaches than I do working relationships because I'm not into the hogwash of recruiting. I'm not into the yada, yada, yada. If I make a suggestion and that coach comes up and goes, no, we want to come back and see her. Don't waste my time anymore. Don't talk to me anymore. Go talk to all these other coaches that want to do this five times. I don't do the song and dance. So we close this account, come back when you want to give me a chance to mess it up. Because I'm not doing this to prove myself, I've done this too long. And I'm, not do I'm over the, the excitement of getting my kids to college, meaning that first kid is awesome. And that first kid you get in that big program, man, that's cool. Then that first kid you see on TV, that's great. The USA team, the championship, man, it, it, and it never gets old. But I'm over like the initial, now this is about credibility. I want people walking up. And like I tried to explain to um, a, couple of, a couple of coaches last week, take your fanciest taste. So whether you like a nice car, whether you like a, a nice wine, uh, a nice steak, uh, a cigar, uh, a pair of shoes, high heels for the women, whatever it is, and you have somebody that gives you that product and they know what you want. And you appreciate the fact that they just walk up and they go, here's what you want. And you're like, that's exactly it. I'm out of here, you got it. But think about this, is every time I walk up to you, I'm gonna give you that third product and that second product, and because I've got to sell, and it's just like, ah, oh, here it comes. It's that whole, it's the turnoff of the sales pitch, instead of that effective sales pitch. So again, 
very important because you guys can personalize this. And you start to do this at 14, 15 years old and blow a coach away with, hey, coach, I just noticed I use this one all the time. Is that a little dog? Do you have a little dog? Do you have a little shih tzu? Do you have a little, oh my gosh, if she has a shih tzu, then that's a boy. That, that, that's, there it is. You guys with the small dogs know what that is like. You can talk on and on about it. But then what happens is she's never met you yet personally. She's giving you something. You've given her something on the phone to attach to, maybe in an email. And now she walks out to the field and she sees you doing that walk. So I'm telling you in reality how this happens, all right? Um, if you're talking to me, hey, Tony, your last game is at 445. We're going to go over here to T1 Park. These parents are all ticked off because they're on the wrong field. But this is what they say. We're going to go see this game at T Winkle Park because this kid keeps riding us and you need to go see him. We'll be back for your 445 game. So they get in their car, they get in their rental car, they drive over to Winkle Park in Costa Mesa, they walk up, and you are that outfielder walking around like this. We did this last week with the cage lion. And your, your persona is out there like this. She doesn't know where you play. Your pitcher throws a nice pitch. Nice pitch. Good, that's it. Good job. Hey, okay, watch. I'll be loud and ball in the air right here. Not just the cutesy little two out things that you guys do, but this stature, the points and stuff like that. And you're into this play persona. And now the coach walks up and she's going, where's number 21? Where's number 21? She's, where's she? And the first thing she does is she sees you walking in the outfield like this. Does it matter if you just struck out and your dad's really pissed off? For most of you, yeah, you're already in the tank and you're out there like this. <laughs> So what ends up happening is everything has to be in order with that kind of mindset. You have to be happy. Everybody has to be happy around you. You had to have just got the hit, and then you're expressing yourself happily. No, nope, you lost it. You worked on the wrong end, and that's what the 98% of the people are doing. So you create that character. Keep going back to the stuff we talked about. This is huge because we talked about this with parents, you know, and players. Manage the quality of your thoughts and your conversations. Pay attention to what you're talking about. Pay attention to what you are talking about. Listen to yourself. Are you keeping it here? Even if there's an injustice, we have had plenty of injustices occur in our, in our experience. Plenty of political stuff, stop the firecrackers, whatever it is. It's, this, our world is not made easy. It's not made, made easy for me in here in Huntington Beach. It's not made easy for us with the firecrackers in the world. Our, our Texas uh, uh, group right now is um, there's a little resistance to the growth of the firecrackers. I feel like we're almost like Walmart going into Texas right now. And the red leaves are like, no, they're not. You're not one of the firecrackers. And, this may go to Texas, so I want to be uh, appropriate about this, but there's, there's resistance, right? And resistance, like, so what do you do? You get mad and back, and, ah, well, that's why we take the red collars. No, you, we, don't, we don't handle confrontation with more confrontation. So I'm, I'm really helping these people just relax, let them say what they're going to say, and in the end, when we haven't resisted them back, they're going to be some of the happiest people at our new complex that we're having built in Texas, and they're going to join us. If we don't give them a reason to just hate us down. And us being there in Texas, okay, right now we'll get over, we'll get past that. So manage the quality of your thoughts and your conversations, because as, you, as soon as you start talking to another teammate, well then I don't know why he brought another third baseman, because you know he told my dad that I was going to play third in September, never mind the fact that you're really not hitting very well, and you haven't really nailed down the position, but he told me that I was going to play third, and so anyways, my mom's really not upset, so we're looking at other teams, and I just, I don't know, I just, uh, what, you want me to hit? She, where's my bad news? And you're not ready. All the time. Players, you know, it takes place in the dugout all the time. So pay attention to the quality of your thoughts and your conversations. Is it productive? Or is it resentful and full of blame? Be very careful of that. Recognize your value and never allow it to be lessened. Players, recognize your value. You've been playing this game a long time. Six years, eight years, ten years. You're experts. Recognize your value. You understand how to play. You know how to put the ball in play. Play catch, throw strikes, put the ball in play. Do those three things, those three things every game, and look at how your team plays. Only do one out of the three, look at the outcome of that game. What's the key to successful defense? Play, catch, and communicate. All right, there's a lot of little simple rules. Okay, you guys know all these things. A 12 and under can coach a six and under team. Generally, you guys have seen most of what you need to see. You've only been playing a few years. All right, so recognize your value and never allow it to be lessened. Because if you're out there in the recruiting world and then you've got a coach who wants to do well and they're playing against um, you know, one of Marty's teams or you know, the athletics or somebody and then you guys are down five to nothing in the first inning and there's coaches there and it's like, what are we doing? What are you doing out there? That's not easy to work with. So players, what do you do? When 
somebody is getting on you and they're not happy, they're displeased with what's going on, don't take it personal. Sticks and stones. You guys know the rest of that, right? Try actually applying that phrase. But words will what? Never heard me. Think about, and then he said, <laughs> I can't but. And then he said, and if we took little Janie to the doctor, the doctor would say, just give her these antidepressants and get her through this little phase and she'll be okay. <laughs> You know, I haven't heard too much of that, but we're not that far away. I mean, think about that. Okay? And, and, and the psychology of the teenage years gets kind of, kind of crazy. So, so never allow it to be lessened. You are unbreakable. You guys have to understand that. Really, really important, all right? Because I want you to radiate happiness and confidence. Radiate it. I want it to be felt around you. Your happiness, your energy can be felt by someone sitting next to you. You can feel it, all right? Radiate it. Make it, make it infectious. So if we do what the two percentile are doing, and we find that route, that direct approach, a little personalization, you make things happen. Because she sees you walk on the field, you present yourself very well, or here, I mean, there's men and women coaches. All right, you're talking out there, you're expressive, you're attractive, you're happy, now the coach likes you. You haven't even had that bad yet. I'm just drawn to this kid. I like the way she's out there. I like the way she's moving. I like this. Now you have your at bat. No, that's, that's not fair. So now everything we talked about, right? On the field, you're at bat, you're swagger, everything. And all you need to do is, what's the most simple approach that you can have to hit it? Your job as a hitter is to do what? Get a good pitch. And a lot of you know that in here, and you probably were swimming around with 12 answers that you've had from those other 12 people that tell you how to hit a ball correctly. All right, and if you're up there and you just tell yourself, get a good pitch. How often does it take before one of those curveballs? Just a, a good pitch, by the way, is just something waist high, inside or outside, thigh high, inside or outside. Not what you like. I like inside. I don't like outside. No, that's a non-professional mindset. It's true. I hit it inside better than outside, but I don't want to hear my veterinarian tell me that I like dogs and I don't like cats and I don't want to treat your cat. They can like dogs. They can not like cats. I treat my cat the same way you treat the dog. Hit the outside pitch. My point is, hit the outside pitch the same way you hit the inside pitch. Because any pitch waist high, ask a pitcher. Sits in that strike so waist high, it's going to get hit. All right? So have your plan when you get in there, and if you happen to get that one pitch, and you hit one ball hard, you, you put everything around the recruiting situation to that coach, and the hit seals the deal. You guys understand that? We've done this over and over and over and over. And before you get concerned with not being in the right tournament or playing on the right field, oh, I think I got this coming up. All right, so here's the reality, all right? I said this to players earlier, okay? You are experts, players. At 14 years old, you're experts. You've been playing eight years. We talked about the degrees that you get in eight years in college, right? So think about that. You are proficient. Proficiency means you understand. If you understand softball, you understand you're not going to be successful with your results all the time. Does it mean you're not a good softball player? Does it mean you're not a good hitter? No matter who is disappointed in you, no matter what the fans, if I, if I buy a ticket, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care about Kobe Bryant's self-esteem. If I'm watching the Lakers, I want to win. And when you guys get to college, okay, even before college, your high schools, your club teams, people just want you to win. So they're not really interested in your self-esteem all the time. You guys have to understand that. So you don't be gauging your value by how people react to when you play. And think about that, because players, you don't do this. You don't take enough responsibility for yourself. And when you do that, you understand that you're an expert. I'll prove it to you over and over and over. If I had one king set up right now, I'd take any player in this, in this room, and I can watch you hit for five seconds, and I can, you can tell me what you've never been able to do before, and I, I'll make anybody a wager here on how we're doing it in 10 minutes. And I just blew some dads away with that concept right there. Because I know how to manage that cage, and I know how to blow up the, the adjustments so that we're not just doing the same thing over and over. I can get a kid to do whatever she's never done. The trick is getting her to think for herself when she walks out of here. It's not about impressing myself. You're going to play in at least 30 showcases. 30. So the SAT test is a pretty important test to take. Imagine if you were told you were going to take the SAT 30 times. You wouldn't stress so much, right? So don't stress on the one, on the three. Oh, gosh, funny, that coach that she wrote was here. Oh, the coach didn't have her in the game. Oh, I don't know if we're going to stay on this team. Oh, finally, the coach was there, and then we had Tennessee, and you had UCLA, and you had her there. And I, 
got to be struck out twice. Oh. It's going to happen. You're going to play in a lot of showcases. You're going to play in a lot. And, and being that 12-month-a-year sport that we talked about, you're going to be in the right place a lot of times, you guys. So don't, you, you can talk about what you're not getting and when you're not getting and when you're not playing. But what you don't do is you don't look at what you, where you've been in one year. I do. I know where you've been in one year. You play all year round. You're going to play in 30 showcases. Over the course of the year, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. Plenty. Plenty of opportunities to play. There's lots of them. Not all of them you want them. Not the way you want them. Not in the lineup the way you want to be. But in the end, are you really going to sit 75 games in a row? If you hit, if you've sit 30 in a row, you might want to raise the question then and maybe make a different decision. But you're going to play. You're going to be out there. There's a lot of opportunities out there. If I say to a kid, so you tell me you haven't got 50 at bats this year? Because dads in here, I don't know how many at bats we get at 14 years old. It was one season, right? About 16 game season. We didn't have winter league at first. I, I think I got one winter league my, my sophomore year in high school. Holy cow. And I had to go from football practice to the, just to go and be able to play. But a winter league baseball game back in the like, early 80s? Oh, heck. So we didn't get a ton of those at-bats. If these kids are getting 50 at-bats, okay? You know how many at-bats your kids are getting? They're getting over 100. They're getting 100 to 200. If they're playing 70% of the time, they're getting between 200 and 350 at-bats in the all-year-round sport. In the high school ages, you have to add your high school um, at-bats in. But that's a lot of at-bats. Baseball, that's similar to a minor league year. You're the most experienced players in the world, therefore the most valuable players in the world, right? Why are you most experienced? Because you play year round. You play great competition every year round. So imagine if you think you're a pretty good soccer player, and I'm sure somebody in here, all the way in the Westers here, they think they're pretty good. So if you're a pretty good soccer player here, and then we send you to, I don't know, Spain, Brazil, go play soccer down there. You're going to find out how good you are or not, right? So the soccer strong countries, which there's a lot of them, and then you realize, holy smokes, we don't really play soccer like that in the States. And anybody that's involved in that knows, and even the dialogue, when you try to talk about soccer outside of this country, like, yeah, American, you guys don't know soccer like we do. Well, how about this? Who knows soccer like we do? There's one country that has an excellent program, and that's Japan. Japan has an excellent developmental program and a great pro league. But if you think about this, Right? Your value as softball players, you are here in the hotbed of softball. I tell coaches all the time, and it's no offense to the other 48 states that I talk about, but if you think the Montana State Player of the Year is going to be able to hold her own against 25 Southern California kids, I don't care how many strikeouts she had for her high school staff said, she has not faced the battle like Southern California players. So when you players leave here or not, I need you to understand this. You walk out of here knowing that, you know, if you put stripes on your arms like the military and you just realize what your credentials are, you have a lot of credentials. So can you guys remember that? Remember that when you leave here. Remember that because you have to own that and then you can control that energy. Because if you control that energy, you're going to control the attraction. And if you control that attraction, you're going to control your destiny. So what's attractive? Ask your parents. Ooh, okay, so what do I mean by that? Ask your parents what it was like when they met each other. Hopefully that's a good story. <laughs> and so what I mean is, ask your parents about, yeah, I do know what it's like. How long was it before I showed your mom my bad side, or my temper, or your husband, my husband, you know, the other side, or whatever. How long was it? Or how did you court each other? How did you dress when you first met them? How did you, what were the compliments like? That whole thing, because again, what's attractive? Because that's your number one responsibility, players, to be attractive on the field. All right, again, I haven't gone on about all the trophies. I haven't gone on about all the tournaments that we won. I haven't gone on about that. That's not, that keeps you in the tournaments longer through Sunday, but that's not how you're gonna get your scholarship. So ask your parents, you know, how did you get your job? What was your job interviews like? Who hired you? Why do you think that you got that? How do we attract people? It's not a traditional softball conversation. Be happy, be gracious, be courteous. Can I, can I say that enough? I say it too much. Be expressive and vocal. Players, be expressive and vocal, right? So you might be kind of shy by nature, a little introverted, so you're not real loud. But if you've chosen to play this sport, the sport demands you and commands you to be loud and expressive. Right? Be a school bus driver and be quiet. There's a bunch of third grade boys on the, on the school bus. Excuse me, would you guys be quiet? It's not going to work. You're going to take your bus. So you have to establish order. You have to establish boundaries. So be expressive and be vocal. Shoulders need to be relaxed. You're gonna, your walk is going to be calm. 
You're going to take your time. When is it the most time, important, to take, uh, important time to be slow? Is in between pitches. Take your time in between pitches. Nice and smooth. Smooth, explosive play. So smooth, nice and relaxed, until you decide that that pitch is going to work. Right? So we pitch, everything's nice and easy until it is, bam, that falls out of your hand. Right? I come up and I throw the ball, and I let that ball go out of my hand. So everything is smooth, slow, and deliberate until I explode. Go back to that picture of that Black Panther. She was sitting on that rock or that tree or whatever she's sitting on, and how fast. You know, the, the cat reflex is how fast they pounce on what they're looking for. And play like you expect good things to happen. Don't be surprised when good things happen. All right? Be surprised when you miss the ball. Be surprised when they pop up. And they're lucky that you popped up. For the little lefties, the lefties that turn around and you turn around your sophomore year, your junior year, because lefties that can create close plays at first base and use their athleticism and use that speed to create convergence, create close plays at first base, you have value. What do I do, Tony? I've never swung away. Sell it. Sell it. You've never, or sell it. You've swung away. They'll go out there and just swing as hard as you can. If, they, if that coach puts that third baseman right in your face and that left fielder on the dirt, swing hard. I'm going to take kind of a funky look and swing, but I'm going to swing hard. So kind of just swing hard and then back up like, let me miss that. <laughs> because that body language, think about that. That body language will say something. You want to, here, here's the test, all right? Lefties, try it. If you're a small gamer lefty and you don't swing away, you don't have a lot of confidence, it's because you're worried about hitting the ball. Stop it. Play with the other team's head. If they're going to dis if they're going to position their, uh, I'm going to call it disrespect, position their defense right in your face, just say, you know what, I'm going to swing hard, I'm going to try one of Tony deals, and I'm going to swing hard and I'm going to sell it. And listen for this afterwards. Swing that bat hard. Don't swing like, oh no, or the do arm taps, because then they just bring everybody closer. Swing hard, back out, and then hear, see if you hear this. A whistle, and then they back up the left fielder. Because that coach is going to back up the left fielder, and he sees something, and he's like, uh-oh, there's back speed there that I didn't know was there, and I don't want to get burned. I don't want this kid beat from my left fielder. And when you get that the whistle, and the left fielder backs up, what's happened out? Third baseman backs up a step, shortstop backs up a step, or that scene between the infield and outfield gets bigger, and now the little slaps can pop in, so you spaced out the defense. All right, does that make sense? So think about it. If you're an actor, what do you do as an actor? You become something from a script that you're not. You sell it to everybody so that they believe it on screen and they go back and they want to spend more money. So whatever you guys got to do to act even more confident, do it because you understand it's awful. It's really, really important. Okay, so if that's attractive, what is a detraction, right? What lessens value, right? What takes away from work, okay? So I will go through these, but I don't want to talk about it a lot because I'd like to think about what we want to do in life, but they have to know these. Rush, anxious behavior, you're not aware of yourself. So your heart's beating fast and you've got worried, and you're disappointed, and there it is. Twirl the bat. You better hope there's not a hunter out there. There's a lot of hunted versus the hunted. So rush, anxious behavior, distressed facial muscles, distressed facial muscles. How often do you talk about that like that? Crinkled eyebrows, right? Looking at the stands, looking into the stands, hearing parents from the stands. Again, now I, I, when I'm seeing this, I'm, I'm that college coach. Do yourself a favor, don't yell at your kids through the stands, like when the coaches are there. Don't, don't do it at all, period. But if anything, you're gonna start with anywhere your development, it does not help the situation at all, right? When she's getting in there, hit up the middle, whatever it is. So don't do it. Just let her out there and have that moment because. That's a detraction. It's not an attraction. There isn't a coach that goes, wow, pretty intense family here. I think I want that one. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Retracing after you make a mistake, right? The pitcher that throws the pitch, he goes, which is almost like accepted traditional normal behavior. I see it in lessons all the time. But think about it. I'm hitting off of you, and I'm looking at you, retrace your arm. I'm about to gobble you up. I'm going to eat you up. You're, you're worried about your arm and I'm in the box? So think about it. It doesn't, it doesn't engage the competition. Where does the, where does the camera go after the shortstop makes an error? Right on the shortstop and into the coast. So don't do this. Don't do that. It's the detraction, right? What does Derek Jeter do after he throws the ball away? And he knows that everybody's looking at 
So no retracing after you make a mistake, and don't do this. Okay? Just take it like a champ. Okay? You just didn't come out on top today. You played better than this. We said this last week. I gotta get better, Dad. So I know you're mad. But I gotta get better. I gotta, I gotta be able to hit the off-speed pitch. I gotta, I gotta be able to put my change for a strike. So before we're talking about leaving the team, I gotta get better. I'm not gonna make excuses. In fact, I'm kinda glad I'm on a team with a pitcher this good. She's only gonna make me better if I have the right attitude towards making myself better. So don't make excuses. You can talk about situations around you, but the more you talk about anything around you, the less you get away from the controllables. I think. All right, right, left, and stay open-minded. Camps and videos. All right, quickly on camps. Camps, you want to experience a couple of camps. So as you guys start to get asked, send her to my camp. Hey, I really like to see her at my camp. Can you bring her out to Oklahoma? We'd like to see her at Florida. Okay, experience a couple of camps generally. You want to experience at least a couple of camps. Camps are pretty cool, and they're a smaller format. So 40 to 60 person camps are doable. That's what you want. You don't want to go to camps. Generally, for me, I don't think it's a good idea when there's 200, 300 kids there. There's a fundraiser camps. Not a lot of uh, attention. Okay, so small camps and only go to a couple. Be careful in how many you go to because what's going to happen is that you enter the recruiting process and coaches are guilty of this all the time. A coach will come up, a college coach will walk up to your coach and go, hey, by the way, tell me about so-and-so. We just really like her. But because that coach is new, the coach runs and tells you, uh, by the way, what the mistake would like to you. And there you are, and you're ready to like, have everything and go to Oklahoma State, it just was a, it was a general inquiry. Okay, they want to know if you go to a camp. Then next thing you know, you've been asked to go to eight camps. You do the plane tickets, you do the hotel rooms, you just pay for one year of college. So you do want to experience a couple of camps, but you don't want to be going to every camp that asks you because there's no risk to the college coach at all. And once you get a little farther down the development road of recruiting, that, that, that general interest has to be stronger than general. So whether it's the coach's conversation or your conversation with a phone call before you agree to take the, the trip, and that is just trying to get an idea of the level of interest that we're at. Because there's nothing wrong with saying, we're trying to just make sure that we um, are smart with our resources. So camps are important, and, uh, and the YouTube videos, I don't know, um, pretty easy to do. I don't want to discourage anybody that's in the business of trying to help people promote themselves, but in the days of, the days of spending $500 or $1,000 for a bunch of DVDs and things like that, when you could just put the YouTube link on and send it an email, so it's probably the easiest way to do it. Not as professional, not, but just get it out there. Get it out there. Most of these videos, I'm telling you, get turned off in about 10 seconds, though. So be careful of over overdoing your videos. You don't need to be out there six hours with a big service that's not being built from the outfield 75 times. You're just going to make yourself tired, and you really want these things to be very, very short, and no longer than three to four minutes. Get to five minutes, it better be like a winner. Uh, you narrow your choices. Um, okay, narrow your choices and taking your trips. You're going to know when it's time to narrow choices because you're going to start to getting offers. All right. Um, players are like poker games. So let me go back up to this one, okay? So when you get ready to narrow your, 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 your choices, look at your players like they're a poker game. So where this projector is, let's say that that's your dog. And that's what a poker game is. I'm kind of just generally interested when I'm walking around the field and I'm just kind of watching her, all right? When I pull up a chair and I decide I want to play this game, all right, now you've seen that coach at your games four to five times. It's not just a pass through. Okay? When I sit in that chair and I throw my bed in, that meant that I just went up to your coach and go, I just want to let you know you want your shortstop. Okay? When I throw my cards in and I make my bet, now I just told you or your coach, I've got a full scholarship. So if you look at the poker game kind of scenario, and you look at that kind of level of interest, kind of watch coaches, watch the way they stand, watch when they're closer, watch when they're there, because those levels of interest will kind of tip off to you, right, how much you invest back in that coach. Okay? And that's going to help you narrow your choices when you start telling coaches, you know what, um, when to let schools go. So you know what, thank you, but at this point, we've kind of narrowed things down to about five schools, and I just want to let you know out of respect to you, so that you don't continue, I want you to be efficient with your recruiting process, because we want them to continue to have a good relationship with our team. So when we start to let schools go, it's because we've already got an accumulation of schools. We want to acquire schools, and as we start to get that interest, start to formulate into offers and strong interest, we can start to let the other schools know that we're not interested. So if you have an offer from Florida International and they give you a 75% offer and it was one of the first offers you had, and, you, and it's kind of far from home, but it's the first one you got, and no, 
how New Mexico comes in and then UNLV comes in with the Navy. Okay, now it's time to let Florida know unless there's a reason why you want to, you want to go out there. You got family, there's something out there, you want to see this full one. Okay? And then last one is when do you commit? Alright? When do you commit? When things are right. Okay, when it's the best possible fit. So between the financial part of it, the location, the geographical part of it, the playing time, the competitive, it depends on what you want. Okay, it depends on what you want. You have to look for a balance of all the things that you're going for with recruiting. You have to create a balance for all the pieces because there's a lot of things that go into the experience. It's the school, it's the social life, it's the practice. Um, you know, Stanford and Cal Berkeley, two great academic schools, two completely different environments as far as training the software. So you want to know the difference of, of, of those different schools. But you're going to commit when everything gets to a point where it's now, okay, we've seen a few schools, we let her sleep on it three or four days, and she's woke up every morning going, Mom, that's where I want to go. Dad, that's where I want to go. Okay? All right, last thing, that, raise your hand if you're a committed player here. Okay, so there's not a lot of them in here, okay? But the last thing I was going to do, and I'm not going to even go to this, this slide, Joe, is after you commit, your work is not done, you guys. When you commit, you're, you're going to be relieved, and you're going to be off that roller coaster that I told you is a pretty crazy ride. But when you commit as a 15 and 16 year old kid, you have the two to three years still to develop. And I'm going to tell you right now that this recruiting age that we're in right now, where the 14 and 15 year olds are getting recognized for their talent at a very early age, I, I'm not going to name names, but I'm going to tell you there's 20 to 30 percent of the kids that are juniors and seniors right now that committed as freshmen, and their game went, went like this in the last year and a half. Not like this, it went like this. And their value for these top schools that took them as freshmen is less than half of what it was when they committed. Why? Because they stopped developing emotionally, they stopped developing um, competitively, they stopped working, they, there's a little bit of entitlement there, I don't know why, but it's there, but be very, very careful of that. The earlier you commit, that just gets that out of the way, but we have to prepare you to make sure that you're ready to go. Because the deal is done when you graduate from college. When you're done, and you got that diploma, and that coach says to us, you know what, I don't care what her batting average was, good or bad, All-American, a great role player. She delivered Tony everything that you said. She was a great person. She helped. She was conscientious. She was a pleasure to be around. I can't wait to go to her wedding today. She's a great kid. And she got that piece of paper and she set it for the rest of her life. That's when it's done, you guys. It's not when you agree to go to school. And it's not when you get to school. It's when you're done. Because when you guys get that college degree, it's not your only road to happiness and it's not the most important part of happiness, but it gives you a tool like no other tool when you guys get that college degree. All right? Not the only way to be happy. Happiness is something else. But it's a very, very powerful tool to help create the rest of your life. Okay? okay. Thanks, everybody. Be careful going home. Oh,